lady then. I should have shaved, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. All right, friend, one second. Let me do something. Okay, friend. I'm live right. streaming. I'm recording. Awesome. The thing is, yeah, so we're not going to mention your name. We're just going to wait a few more minutes, though. Okay. All right. Okay, folks in the channel, we're going to keep our friend anonymous because he does some work for the Lord. So that's all I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you more than that, especially on this Resurrection Sunday. We worship the risen Lord of glory. Man. He's alive now. You do believe he's been raised physically, right? I do. Okay, good. That's good to know. Yeah. All right. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We're just going to wait a few more minutes, guys. And we're going to engage the topic. He's going to try to demonstrate that Jesus, though he is God, he's a Trinitarian. So don't misunderstand his position. He's a Trinitarian, but he believes that Michael is one of the names of Christ. And Michael is not a creature because, as I said, on this channel, on my own YouTube session, when I went through the multi-part series on Michael being Jesus and on David Wood's talk with vocab, there are Trinitarians like John Gill and there are Seventh-day Adventists who are Trinitarians that believe Jesus is God Almighty uncreated, but that one of his names is Michael because Michael is not a creature. Now, he knows <clears throat> more than I do that now there's a revival among the Adventists in trying to go back to what they believe, the true roots of Adventism, which is Arianism, that Jesus is the first creation of God the Father. You're aware of this, right? I am actually not aware of it. You're kidding me. I'm not. It's all over social media, on YouTube. In fact, one of the spokespersons for this position, I believe he's Iranian. I don't okay. know if he's a convert. I don't know if he converted from Islam to Seventh-day Adventism. And his name slips my mind, but now there is what's basically causing an uproar and perhaps a split because he's now, and others with him, not, he's not the only one, trying to bring Adventists to their quote-unquote roots, and they're trying to prove that Ellen G. White either is misinterpreted or her position on the Trinity isn't faithful to the original Adventists that believe that Christ is the first creation of God the Father. So you need to check yeah. into that because it's causing, causing yeah. a stir. Yeah, I haven't haven't really heard of it. I mean, it's in one of our fundamental beliefs that Jesus is the eternal uh, Son of God. Yes. And so it's... Uh, but historically, it's are you aware? There's definitely been several sects trying to um, win converts from Adventism into another... Yeah false doctrine so yeah but are you aware historically at the adventism when it was initially started uh a group of adventists were called i believe the millerites the and, millerites yeah that was a movement before adventism began well there's uh, well hold on let me double check now because you're saying before adventism because the millerites are also identified with adventism let me just double check because i don't yeah. want to go from my men uh, memory hold on a second buddy the Adventists came from the yep, Miller. They're, they're identified as Adventists. It says, out of this third Millerite group, the Seventh-day Adventist Church arose, right? Yep. So you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so but what did uh, William Miller actually believe? Um, well, first of all, I'll start by saying I'm not the most knowledgeable historian or scholar. Neither I'm am I. Just We're both humble. students, buddy. Yeah, so, yeah. and... Um, but yeah, what I'm aware of is that the Millerite movement was preaching that Jesus was going to come in 1844. Sure. Uh, they interpreted uh, Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse, I think, 14, that says yeah. that at the end of 2300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Yeah. And they interpreted that as... Eric, do me a favor, friend. Christ. Eric, do me a favor. And I say this respectfully. Don't go on tangents. I'm not talking about their prophecies. I'm talking about their view of Jesus. Oh, Sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I thought you were asking. If no, I... no, because we're going to keep one thing about me. I try to maintain order. We're going to focus. Anytime yeah. you go on a tangent, I'm going to bring you back in. We're not focused on their false prophecies because I, I'm even aware that people accuse Ellen G. White of the same thing. And they accuse Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith. And I'm not going into the issue of prophecy. Yeah, I was what just I'm asking almost, you is William Miller. Summarizing what no, no, no. Don't summarize was what his prophecy is. So we don't talk over each other, friend, because... I don't want people saying that I'm being unkind to you, but I don't want you to go on tangents. What did William Miller believe about Jesus? That was my question. 
I, I am not aware of that. Okay. I'm no, not that's exactly fine. sure. Yeah. No, that's fine. Uh, I'm like I said, we're both students. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the time, nor do I have the desire to try to explore seven day Adventism with great depth. Because like I said pe to people, you can be a jack of all trades and master of one. Yeah. Or you can focus on one area and try to learn as much as you can about a particular area. And so that when you have a group that arises, you may not mm -hmm. know much about that group, but once they question a particular doctrine of the Christian faith, and you know that the Bible teaches a particular doctrine, your knowledge of that doctrine will be sufficient to expose any group, even though you may not know with great depth what that group particularly believes, mm -hmm. right? So if you've mastered the biblical foundation for the Trinity and yeah. a, a cult arises, like the black Hebrew Israelites, and they deny the Trinity. I may not know all the nooks and crannies of that particular movement, but the fact that they deny the Trinity is sufficient grounds to know that they're a false group, they're not true Christians, and then I can show them from scripture their erroneous views of the Godhead are wrong. So that's why I wanna focus on, even though you're a Trinitarian, because you put comments in the comment section, and one thing I don't like, when people write lengthy comments and comment section, because I don't have time to respond to written comments where we go back and forth for 50,000 posts. And because if I write a comment, you can respond and get away without addressing the actual issue. And then I have to go back and then show why you didn't address it. Whereas when we talk face to face, we save tons of time and we go to the mm -hmm. point and we don't go into tangents. And that's one thing I'm gonna ask you not to do. Do not go on tangents. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'll, okay. I'll do my best. I want you to focus because you are a Trinitarian. Now, apart from that, there are people who have problems with Ellen G. White being a prophetess. And that's why some people won't consider Seventh-day Adventists as being Christian. Others do. Because from my recollection, don't, don't quote me on this, but I recall perusing Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults. And if memory <clears throat> serves me well, and I'm not in error, what I understood from reading that section, and it's been a long time, I can be wrong. So guys, like I said, I'm going by memory. Long time. I believe that Walter Martin did not classify Seventh-day Adventist as a false heretical cult. But then on the John Ankerberg show, when he was debating a Seventh-day Adventist spokesperson, the impression I got that if you believed in Ellen G. White, you would consider you a cult. Again, Walter Martin is not infallible. That's just his opinion. But there are Christians who are divided. Like Acts 17 Apologetics, he's in my tech, uh, chat channel. You know him as David Wood, the great white hope, the great white yeah. dope, I mean hope. He actually did a video on, in honor of Nabil Qureshi, who's now with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, again, we're going to begin in prayer, but I just want you to give you a little background. Nabil yeah. Qureshi was accused by Muslims as being a heretical Muslim mm -hmm. because he was Ahmadiyya. Now, Acts 17 Apologetics did a video, and he actually brought in seven-day Adventists. And he made an excellent comparison, which was impressive because he rarely impresses me. David Wood rarely impresses me, right? I'm rarely impressed. But he said, if you can accept Seventh-day Adventists as a Christian group, though they believe in L.G.Y., then by the same tokens, by the same grounds, then uh, and you should view Ahmadiyya as a legitimate sect of Islam with different interpretation because they still affirm the core fundamentals of Sunni Islam. Like you guys still affirm the core doctrines of the Christian faith in respect to the Godhead. I said, wow, David, you impressed me. And you rarely impressed me, but I was impressed. <laughs> now let's begin in prayer. More yeah, people right. will show up a little later. So we're going to focus on Jesus' identity as Michael. So we're going to ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. And Holy Spirit, Amen. we ask for a powerful anointing. Please guide this conversation. Please yes, control the course of this conversation. Mortify our flesh, destroy our egos and our pride to listen attentively and to trust your leading Holy Spirit that you will guide, you will reveal, you will illuminate for the glory of Jesus Christ. We submit to you. We entrust ourselves to you entirely. Please, Holy Spirit, use this session. Use my friend Eric. Use me to bring glory to Jesus Christ and bless the people here anoint them and bring them, bring more to listen to this conversation that it may be fruitful to honor Jesus Christ as God Almighty, which we both agree. Jesus is the eternal son. He is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. 
one with the Father and you. Anoint us this time. Anoint us and give us the health we need to do this work in the holiness to delight the heart of our God. Amen. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for hearing us for the sake of Jesus. We thank you, Father. We love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Increase in us and please crucify our flesh yes, Lord. and shine through us for your glory. In Jesus' almighty name. Amen. All right. Now, people, uh, we got most of the regulars are not here yet, but that's fine because this was impromptu last minute. They're expecting me to go live a little later on Abraham and Isaac being a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Beautiful. you believe the archangel Michael is another name for Jesus. Let me just repeat so they understand what you're not saying. Mm -hmm. He's not saying Jesus is a creature. That's right. He believes Michael is the name of Jesus, but that Jesus is God Almighty, the second person of the Trinity. So I know you guys may be a little confused and think, well, how can that be? Because to them, Jesus has various names, various titles, and assumes various roles, none of which suggests that Jesus is a mere creature, even though he did become man. He agrees with me. At a mm -hmm. point in history, Jesus became man. And his human nature was created. And that when Christ rose this Easter Sunday, which we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, Christ rose physically, bodily. But his physical body yeah. is now immortal, glorious, indestructible. So he yeah. is the God-man. He agrees with that. He believes. That's right. <clears throat> he is the God-man. So he is a Trinitarian. You guys with me before I ask him questions? You, you understand he's a Trinitarian, right? <clears throat> okay. Everyone got it right on board? All right. Now, give me what you consider your strongest proof that Jesus, one of his names is Michael. Um, one of the strongest proofs is... Yeah. We'll, walk, think, we'll, walk, we'll walk through your text, but what you think yeah. in your mind is one of the strongest. Your I best, in other words. 4. Say it again. First is Thessalonians 4. Yeah, 13 to 18, right? Yep. Okay, unpack it for me. So it says, uh, let me pull it up right here. Okay, he's going to be quoting First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And this is what he believes one of the strongest proofs that demonstrate that Jesus is Michael, though he's not a creature. He's not a creature. Folks, remember, he does not believe Jesus is a creature. So he is a Trinitarian, so he's different. Treat him differently. He's not a Unitarian. He's not an Arian. So I'm not seeing the comments right now, so they can say no, anything. I'll, no, I'll no, it's now. okay. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to, because I want this to be beneficial to them, not just to you. I want yeah. them to hear a seven day Adventist. Who's a, who's a missionary, which will remain nameless. I can't mention his name because he's doing work. And so we honor uh, that. Okay. So well, read it. First for us. Thessalonians. Uh, what Bible version you're using? Um, right now. I just pulled one up on my computer that only has King James. Okay. That's fine. Is that uh, what you prefer though? Is that what you use? Uh, I don't care. Have ESV okay. and KJV. It doesn't matter. Okay, go ahead. Read for us. Um, for the Lord himself, this verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, mm -hmm. with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Mm -hmm. You finished And uh, then we, we which remain alive mm -hmm. shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then 18 says, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so what in that context leads you to assume this is a strong case for Jesus being identified as Michael? Well, this is um, one of the cases for Jesus being identified as the archangel. You said the archangel, right? Because in this text, it doesn't mention Michael. Yeah, no, but you said the archangel. Are you assuming there's yes, only yes. one archangel? I am assuming that there is only one archangel. Uh, what's, yes. Why would you assume that? Um, well, from... The canonical text, mm -hmm. uh, we know that there's only two times archangels are mentioned, mentioned, mm -hmm. and the, that is Christ and Michael. No, but and no. Before you say two times, this is. Let me just correct you how not to argue your case. Don't yeah. assume what you've yet to prove. You're assuming that for Thessalonians four, Jesus is definitely identified as the archangel Michael. That's begging the question. We'll get to that. So yeah. let yeah. me just gently yeah. correct you. You meant there's only one time that someone is identified as the archangel michael that's in jude 1 verses 9 verse 9 but yes. it's 8 9 for the context right yes jude 1, 9. okay you know you don't you don't argue your case from silence this is what we call an argument from silence because michael is specifically said to be an archangel it doesn't mean he's the only one what explicit proof do you have 
He's the only archangel. Um, okay, so Michael is is the only one that is mentioned as the archangel in the Bible. So if in the New uh, Testament, you mean, right? In the New Testament, yes, that's right. And uh, I'm not building a case from silence, but I don't have any reason to think otherwise if there's no other mention. Well, no, you do because the New Testament is not written in a vacuum. There's an historical okay. cultural background. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, number two, go to Daniel 10, 13, because you said you don't care what translation. So I hope you don't backtrack because we're going to look at Daniel 10, 13. And I know okay. you're going to backtrack. And I hope you don't, because when I asked you what translation you prefer, because I was going to stick with your translation, you said you don't you don't care. Hopefully you're going to be consistent because a sign that a position is weak and unbiblical is when you have to backtrack from what you've said earlier. And I know you're not going to do that because as a Trinitarian, you're supposed to be a man of integrity and consistency for the glory of Christ. But this will be a test. Daniel 10, 13. What does it say? Michael is what? Uh so, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And the only I chief prince there with kings with the kings of Persia. The only chief prince. It says one of the chief princes. Okay, you understand what chief would be in Greek, right? Uh, RK. Yes. So now, please don't backtrack because I asked you. That's why I asked you. What translation you go? ESV. King James, and I think you said NIV. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, New King James. I okay, New King James. Let's look at the New King James. Protestant, can you post New King James? Can you post New King James? Should I be looking at the live stream? Uh, no, it's okay. I'll read it for you, brother. I want to make it very convenient for you, and I'm going to read it for you. It's okay. I mean, if you want to, if you want to go to YouTube, look, just silence the YouTube channel. It's up to you. Uh, but whatever is convenient for you. Here. New King James, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia with, withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Even if you want to render it as the New World Translation does, one of the foremost princes, he's still one of. Mm -hmm. And since if he's one of, the burden of proof is, is on you now to show he is the only chief prince or the only <clears throat> archangel. It's on you now, not on me. You're making the assertion. Okay. So... Okay. You made the assertion, so you don't have to satisfy the burden of proof. Give me one moment. Sure. And whatever source you quote, obviously, it's not to be inspired, infallible, and errant. And if it's a source that's biased to your position, don't expect me to <coughs> then accept it as authoritative because you have to make your case exegetically. Okay. Right? It's exegesis, right? Not appealing to authority. So as, right. as you're looking it up, let me know if no, you find I, it because I have other I'm passages. Opening, I'm opening the, the, the email that I actually sent you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're reading your own email? And sorry, it was a little bit long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Bear with us, guys. Bear with us. Hey, Daily Light, brother. You know okay. what the rules are. It's not you, brother. Eric, hold on. Let me see. This. Guy, I'm sorry. Let you. I'm going to call you Tony. Is that all right? That's fine. Okay. Eric is fine. Just don't just close the hole. No, no, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna. I don't want to mention your name. So I'm sorry about that, brother. It's a slip. We okay. we won't know. We won't tell anyone where you're from because you're doing some great work and God protect you. But daily light, okay. do me a favor. Daily light. I'm talking to someone in the comment section, and he's been here for a while. He knows. Mm -hmm. Brother, please don't tell me what to do and how to do it. As I as you can see, daily light. I treat this him as a brother because he's a Trinitarian. I actually bent over backwards to say, do okay. not view him as those who are Arians and Unitarians. So why are you telling me what to do daily life? Do you want to stay in my channel, friend? Sorry, sorry, Eric. I try to run a, let's say again. Appreciate it. Uh, Appreciate it. So what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry, please, Lord, help me not to mention this brother's name. Uh, forgive me. It's not deliberate. It's okay. Just go ahead. What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to run a tight ship on my channel because mm -hmm. my time is limited and I try to tell people some rules to follow, help me to help them. And then one of the things they do is violate one of the rules by telling me, 
uh, hey, I'll be humble and nice to this guy. I, I, I'm not to be to hold you to a position and be forceful is not being disrespectful to you. It's holding you to a higher standard because you believe in the Bible and you know that we have to be able to prove from Scripture what we believe, not just by pulling verses, but understanding their historical, cultural context, as well as their relationship to what the Bible teaches as a whole. So Daily Light, sit back, friend. I want you to enjoy it. See, you just, you're a nuisance right now. You just distracted this conversation by your comment, Daily Light. You know that, right? You're not helping. But go ahead, my brother. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, well, I would like to... Uh, okay. Sorry. Let it, is this because my connection is like 99% good? So just hold on, brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will get, I'm going to give you as much grace as I can. Go ahead now. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Um, yeah, well, I'm just going to say that uh, give me some grace with my comments as sure. I, uh, I'm not an apologist. I don't know the, all the rules of, of apologetics and things That's like that. And I will make mistakes when I say something. I may make assumptions. That's okay, that brother. Apologists you can. shouldn't make. For example, if I say that, uh, any any translation is okay. I would take that as obviously I wouldn't take Jehovah's Witnesses translations and any other translations. I would just, I spoke that out of the assumption yeah. that we would agree that that the Word of God and the truth shines through any translation, any common translation of the of the Bible. No, brother. What I was trying to suggest is the only translation you would have that would translate contrary to the standard. Mm -hmm. evangelical translations that are used by Trinitarians across the board, English Standard Version, New King James Version, New International Version, New American Standard Bible, you'll find them routinely translating the Hebrew construction as one of the chief mm -hmm. princes. I only mention that to show that the New Jehovah's Witnesses translated one of the foremost princes, but even in that translation, he's one of, he's not the only one. I do not know, I'm not aware, and that's not, and again, I can be ignorant because I'm not all-knowing, I am not aware of any legitimate translation done by bona fide scholars, a committee translation. You'll find maybe mm -hmm. a translation by one individual. But when you have one individual doing a translation, <clears throat> that's a lot of weight to put on one person because no one person is qualified to translate the 66 canonical books. That's why you have committees doing it. Even the King mm -hmm. James Version had about mm -hmm. 64 top-notch renowned scholars translating the entire Bible. So okay. I don't know of any legitimate translation that renders it other than one of the chief princes, not the first of the chief princes, but even that doesn't support mm -hmm. that he's the only one. So if you go with the okay. first of, he's still the first of, but he's not the only one because there are other chiefs. Okay. But go ahead. Okay. In the, in the email, I said that this is probably, for me, the best argument to say that, mm -hmm. uh, that Michael is it's one of many created beings or chief princes. Uh, but in the context of all the other points, which I would love to discuss as well. We will. Um, and I think that because there are multiple tr possible translations for this, then um, the whole of Scripture would paint a better picture yeah. than just this one text and then dismiss the, the, the rest of the passage. Yeah, but see, so you again beg the question. You're assuming this is the one text that explains everything else away because it assumes... You've interpreted 1 Thessalonians 4 correctly, and that's what I just questioned you on. Let's go with your interpretation. 1 Thessalonians 4, Jesus descends with a shout in the voice of an archangel, an archangel. Okay. Then you went to okay. Jude 1, nine to show that Michael is called the archangel. Assumption, since only Michael is called the archangel, and Jesus mm -hmm. comes down with the voice of an archangel, ipso facto, Jesus mm -hmm. and Michael are the same person. So I didn't go to Mark 10, uh, Daniel 10, 13. I went to your proof text and showed you, no, mm -hmm. not so fast. Because yeah. the voice of an archangel doesn't mean it's the same archangel Michael if we then take into consideration Michael is one of many, not the only one. So what's your okay. proof that he's the only one? Well, first on that passage, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so when it says, uh, well, at least my translation here, it says that Jesus is uh, with the voice of the archangel, sure. but that's not what I'm focusing on, but yeah. the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Mm -hmm. And I would think that he has the trump of God because he is God. Not necessarily. Therefore, he would have the voice of God because he's archangel. Not necessarily, no. Go to Matthew and he 24. has the power of a resurrection and he uses the trumpet of God and the voice of the archangel in order to raise the dead. Brother, you're, you're assuming too much. You just okay. assume. Can you show me where the trump of God and the voice of the archangel causes the resurrection in that passage you read? Show me that. 
show me that the shout of the the voice of the archangel on the trumpet is what raises the dead. Well, we know it from other passages. That no, we don't. It is. It is okay. Give there is no other second. passage that says a okay. trumpet the voice will of Jesus raise. That bro, raises you're talking over me now. Now you're being rude. Listen uh, carefully yes. to me because you're begging the question again. Mm -hmm. There is no passage that says the dead are raised at the sound of a trumpet. That's what you just said. You just said the voice of an archangel on the trumpet will resurrect the dead. That's not what the text itself says. And if you go to Matthew 24, 29 and 31, you'll see that Jesus is accompanied with a group of angels and they will <clears throat> announce his coming with a trumpet. Go to Matthew 24, okay. 29 and 31. Matthew 24. 29 and 31 and read it for me. Uh, 29 to 31. Yeah. Yes, hold on one second. Chris Linson, why are they mentioning the Jehovah Witness? Are you upset with that, Chris? Can you tell me if you're upset? I want to know if you're upset. Hold on one second, friend. You can go to Matthew 24, 29, 31. Chris that Linson, did that upset you? I'll let have you read in a minute. I just want to, because we have sometimes nuisances in the chat that we have to then clean house. Uh, Chris Linson, answer me quickly. I don't have all day for you, friends. All right. All right. Now, Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Mm -hmm. okay. Ready? Yeah, read it for me. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the power of heaven will be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn for they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, okay, and they so will who's, gather who's, together. Who has the trumpet there? He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Mm -hmm. So who's and, sounding out the trumpet? Jesus? Well, this this could be interpreted as the, he is sounding the trumpet as he sends his angels, or his angels are sounding the trumpet. So you're basing now your argument, which you said was one of your strongest. You said it, not me on something that is ambiguous and unclear, that's not how you make a strong case for your position. But then notice this coincides with the gathering of the elect, which is the same thing as in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, because if you finish it, those who are alive are caught up to be with the Lord in the air. So this that's coincides right. with the same event. What mm -hmm. I'm trying to show you here is that Jesus is not alone. There are a group of angels and a sound of the trumpet, he gathers the elect, meaning the trumpet sounds, this is the time that the angels will gather the elect to Christ. Okay. Okay, so... You're assuming that Jesus is the one who sounds a trumpet. You're assuming that his voice of the archangel is what resurrects the dead. There's a lot of assumptions going on. Whereas if we take the scripture as a whole, and I'll, I'll prove that. The sound I, of the I archangel. Have a, a question and maybe a statement in this. Go ahead. You want to ask me a question? Go ahead. Um, and I sorry if I no, um, sorry. speak over you sometimes. There's a little bit of delay and it's hard to. That's okay, it, friend. But, uh, it's, apologies. That's okay. Go ahead. What's your question? Um, so. So here you're talking about the trumpet. So the trumpet is of God. And it, and I would say that the voice of the archangel is what raises the dead. You have to prove uh, that. In John chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. There we go there. It's 28 to 29. I know it. But you have to prove that's the voice that raises the dead. I know what John 5, 25 and 28, 29 says. Not 27. Because 27 20. talks about he will judge because he's the son of man. He says the, the hour is coming. Those who are in their graves will hear his voice. And those... <clears throat> And those who are in green days will hear his voice and they will come out, right? I'm aware of that. Okay. Yet the problem here is, is that you're assuming that in 1 Thessalonians 4, the voice of the archangel is the voice of Jesus that raises the dead. Because if you actually read John 5, 28, 29 carefully, he's talking about mm -hmm. two resurrections. He's talking mm -hmm. about the resurrection of the mm -hmm. righteous and the resurrection of those who will be judged. Now, according to your eschatology, when does the judgment of the damned take place and the resurrection? After a thousand years. Okay, so then you can't appeal to John 5, 28, 29, because there it's a summary, and it's saying the resurrection of both takes place when they hear his voice. Read it. John 5, 28, 29. Read it. It's the resurrection of both the righteous and the damned. But you know there's a delay. So if you're going to take John 5, 28, 29, and try to tie it in with 1 Thessalonians 4, that's proving too much, because in 1 Thessalonians 4, there is no resurrection of the damned. It's the resurrection of the righteous. Well, if if there's something you may not know about the Adventists, interpretation of this there uh there are wicked that will be raised at the second coming of christ before the millennium 
and the okay. final judgment takes place after the millennium. Okay, so, but this is the judgment, John 5, yes. 20, 29, because you wrenched 27. Mm -hmm. Brother, I'm going by what you're giving me. 27 says, mm -hmm. this coincides with the Son of Man judging, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so you're taking a summary statement of John okay. and then trying to impose that on 1 Thessalonians 4 when what you have that comes later on is a fleshing out of what Jesus speaks briefly, succinctly. And if you're aware of how the Gospels function, Jesus mm -hmm. gives the impression, if you just take Jesus' words, mm -hmm. uh, the resurrection of the righteous and the damned takes place when he returns and the damned are sent to hell. There is no thousand years. So if you want to go with Jesus, there is no thousand years. The, the resurrection of the righteous and the damned Take place at the same time. And I can show you that through the parables and through Matthew 25, 3 and 46. So if you're going to go to the Gospels, the Gospels are simply summation, summary, succinct statements mm -hmm. about the nature of Jesus' return. Yeah. The rest of the books flesh it out. As they flesh it out, they give us more details. One of the details they give us is that when Jesus comes with his angels, there'll be an archangel who will summon the descent of the Son of Man. But that voice doesn't mean it's raising the dead. You need to prove that. Okay. Okay. The, the main argument there was that the voice of the archangel is of Jesus, that Jesus is the archangel because of the voice, and he has the power to raise the dead. So that's, to me, those are, I'm not saying that it is precisely the voice of the archangel that raises the dead. Okay. It would be Jesus' voice that raises yes. the dead. Okay, but that's the whole point. You made the connection. Let me let me connect it for the people. See what so they know what you're saying. Yeah. John five twenty eight says it's Jesus's voice that raises the dead. First mm -hmm. Thessalonians four says when the Lord comes down, he'll come down with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. Mm -hmm. You then assume that the voice of the archangel is what's raising the dead there, but that's not stated by Paul. So how do you know that the trumpet is not simply announcing to the world? And the voice of the archangel is announcing to the world, the Lord has come. It's an announcement of the king has come. Because if you know about the background, when a mighty king appears, you have a procession. And you have his emissaries announcing, here's the king, honor the king, bow to the king, the king is here. Okay. So why assume that the voice of the archangel is the voice of Christ that raises the dead, as opposed to assuming... There's an archangel that comes with Jesus, and his voice is simply to proclaim to the nations, Behold, your king has arrived. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. So you're saying, if I'm understanding correctly, that there are archangels or an archangel shouting with a voice, proclaiming the coming of Jesus, and the trumpet of God. It could be trumpets blown by God or angels or other. No, it doesn't. No, Jesus. trumpet, yeah. Just let me be real. Trumpet of God means it's a trumpet that belongs to God. But something belonging to God doesn't mean it's used of God exclusively. Okay. Right. So the, yeah. So you're saying they're just simply announcing the coming of Jesus. Of course, that's what they okay. do with any king. When a king comes in, when you see a procession coming in, because again, the cultural historical context is simply this: the New Testament writers are applying the very technical language that the culture at the time would would apply to the appearance of a king, a king manifesting himself or a divine being. And mm -hmm. we know that when a king appears, let's say he appears in procession with his retinue, with his court. He's not alone. So again, if you look at it in its own context and its broader context and its historical context, you're making too many assumptions. And you may be right, but you got to prove it. You can't just assume that your interpretation is ipso facto correct. I need yeah, the proof. I, 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 I would build a case from all the things that mentioned Michael and the Archangel, not just okay. a single passage. So but if you ask me what is the clearest of course i would have to go to one where the archangel and jesus are mentioned together and i think this is the best one so and when in first thessalonians 3 13 says that this is the chapter right before that says that jesus comes with his holy ones and then yes. if you go to saint paul saint paul in second thessalonians 1 5 to 10 and says that jesus will come with powerful angels in flaming fire right. why are you assuming that that archangel can't be one of those holy ones and powerful angels that accompany Jesus. Why assume the archangel has to be Jesus? What, what Paul told you before, for Thessalonians 3.13, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints or holy ones, and then in 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10, Paul then repeats that when Jesus appears, he's not alone, he comes with his powerful angels. So why assume, ipso facto, Jesus is the archangel as opposed to Assuming that one of those powerful angels, holy ones, 
happens to be one of the archangels that come with Christ. Okay, well, I could ask the same question. Why do you have to assume that Jesus is not Michael the archangel? Because and the Bible distinguishes him from Jesus in Jude, in Jude chapter 1 and other places. The very Jude, Jude that you quoted shows. Nine. Say it again. Sorry, I was just mentioning the passage. Yeah, Jude 1 9, that very context backfires against you, which I was about to turn to. But remember, you can't shift the burden of proof. Notice what you did again. You want me to prove he's not Michael when you're the one saying he is Michael. I don't need to mm -hmm. prove disprove your positive assertion. It, the burden's not on me to show he's not Michael because I didn't. I, my argument isn't that, oh, he's not Michael. Let me. You're claiming he's Michael. You need to prove it. See, that's, you, you did it a little subtly, and I know you don't mean anything by it. Well, I, I would ask you, well, what's the proof he's not Michael? Because no one reading the Bible would come to that conclusion unless there's an external tradition telling them to see it. And that tradition is your seven-day Adventist tradition. So now you have to prove it, not shift the burden on me. But I'll respond. I will take that burden on, on me. If you read Jude 1.9, mm -hmm. you'll know that he's referring to a tradition that's found in call, something called the Assumption of Moses. And don't take my word for it. Do you have a commentary or do you have a study uh, note? Not on me, no. Okay. Double check this. And I want everyone listening to me. Double check this. This conversation between Michael and Satan about the burial of the body of Moses is a tradition found outside the Old Testament, and it's found in a source called the Assumption of Moses. Mm -hmm. The Assumption of Moses. Okay, everyone, you with me there, right? So now Jude is known for citing these extra biblical traditions because later on in Jude 1, 14 to 15, Jude 1, 14 to 15, he cites a tradition found in the book of Enoch. Can you read June 1, 14 and 15 for me? Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed to an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Okay. Any Again, any commentary, even a seven-day Adventist commentary by one of your scholars. This is common mm -hmm. knowledge. This is a citation that's found verbatim in a book called The Book of Watchers or The Book of Enoch. And there's an English translation available online on the Internet for free. And it's chapter 1, verse 9. Now, why is that significant? Why is The Book of Enoch significant? Because in The Book of Enoch, the one who's coming is Jehovah God. And you agree with me that, mm -hmm. that Jesus is Jehovah. So you have no problem with that. But here's the problem. That very source that he's referencing and the assumption of Moses that he's referencing the book of Enoch specifically, we'll stick with that. Mm -hmm. Michael is distinguished from the Lord who's coming to judge the ungodly ones. He mm -hmm. accompanies the Lord. He is not the Lord. And he's just one of seven chief ruling angels, not the only one. And then later on in that same book, same book, you can start reading from chapters 44, read all the way to 46, right? Mm -hmm. There you have the son of man of Daniel called the elect one, called the Messiah, and he's distinguished from Michael. So the very source that Jude is appealing to shows that the Lord who's coming is not mm -hmm. Michael, but he's the God of Michael, and Michael comes with him as part of his myriads. But according mm -hmm. to Jude, that Lord who's coming is Jesus. So that means Jesus right there can't be the Michael because Jesus is the Lord of Enoch that Michael accompanies, and then it's further reinforced by the fact that later on, the Son of Man, who's Jesus, the elect one, who's Jesus, is not Michael, but distinct from him. So now historically, you have problems because the sources that Jude is referring to, Enoch, an assumption of Moses, do not identify Michael as the Lord God Jehovah, but as a creature subordinate to him. And yet Jude does identify Jesus as that Lord God Jehovah. Can I ask a couple of questions? Sure. Okay, so I have a few. I'd like for me uh, if I could ask them like a couple, and then you sure, can go. give me answers for both of them or three of them. Um, so, do we know for sure if Enoch is quoting Jude or Jude is quoting Enoch, or if Enoch and Jude could be quoting? Yeah, we know for else? sure. That's one because, question. Yes. Well, let me answer that first before you got. Let me take one. Yes, we do because we found a copy of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls that predates the writing of Jude. Yes, we do historically. Okay. That's a, yeah. And the other question is, um, if he is quoting something else on one verse, yeah. um, if I quote you when I'm doing ministry to Muslims, yes. 
this, that doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with your interpretation of the Ten Commandments or the Sabbath keeping or yeah. or Michael the Archangel. Um, I could I could quote you. I sometimes I even quote the Quran mm -hmm. in a discussion with Muslims in order to yes. to make a point. Yes. And or it might be familiar to them. Yes. Um, to the people mm -hmm. uh, that I'm speaking to. So that. To me, the fact that he's mentioning something in, in uh, Jude 1 9 about mm -hmm. Michael the Archangel, it doesn't mean that it has to be interpreted based yeah. on the book of Enoch, uh, at least logically to me. Yeah, so is that a question? I mean, because I'll answer that very yes. easily. Yes, okay. yes, please. My, two responses. Answer. Number one, it doesn't mean that Jude is endorsing the entire book of Enoch, so I didn't say he is, but the quotation he cited, and he doesn't correct it or explain it or reinterpret it. The Lord who's coming in that very context of Enoch is the God of Michael. It's not mm -hmm. Michael. So whether he accepts the entire book is canonical or he's quoting certain parts, the parts that he does quote distinguish Lord God from Michael because if you read the citation carefully, the myriads that come with the Lord God are his angelic host, one of whom is Michael, and he doesn't correct that. He doesn't reinterpret that. He takes it as face value and he amends it. But the Lord there is Jesus and yet, Michael is not that Lord. That's number one. And number two, you again need to demonstrate that Jude held your view that Jesus is Michael, not assume it in order to reject the conclusion that if Jude is quoting Enoch, and then Enoch, the Messiah, the elect one, the Son of Man, and the Lord God are not Michael, and yet Jude believes Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of Man, and the Lord God, it, the burden is on you again to show that Jude held your belief that Jesus is Michael, and therefore he would reject those parts of Enoch. It's not on me. It's on you. Okay. Well, I'll ask another question. Yes. It, um, I think for me, the greatest uh, proof of that, that Jude interprets Michael to be a Lord yes, Jesus, I, I know where you're God. Yes, Zechariah 3? Is, is Zechariah 3. You know so that's like, going to backfire against you, I know you, right? you know that. Yeah, but you know it's going to backfire against you, right? Sure. I mean, I, I'm, Let me I'm explain why. Right. Fine. What's the context of Jude one nine when Michael rebukes Michael rebukes Satan? Why is he mentioning that? What's the point of Jude there? Um, Michael contending with the devil over the body of Moses. So yeah. So why is he quote, saying that Michael said the Lord rebuke you, Satan? Well, if I'm familiar with the context here, people are uh, causing like. Um, in the church, they're having disturbances, and they're 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 kind of like challenging authority and yeah. and 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 verse and eight. Here, it's sorry? verse eight for the context. I mean, simple. Just read verse eight. It'll tell yeah. you what the context is. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yeah. And here it's pointing that finish the Michael, verse. No, finish the yeah. verse, brother. Read yeah, it again. Mark. Verse eight. Verse 8, likewise, yeah. also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Okay, that's, what that's where you threw me off, dignitaries. The dignitaries okay. there um, refers to celestial beings. The implication is that they even are so aud audacious, they even defy celestial beings. And now read verse 9 to say why that's not a good thing. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil with... And disputed over the body of Moses, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay. So his con his point is, even someone as mighty as Michael would dare not slander a powerful celestial being, but would come against him by the authority of the Lord. So now I want you to read 9 one more time, because I don't really think you've understood the implication of that, because you demoted Jesus. You haven't honored Jesus, because I want you to read 9 again. Okay. Um, yes. I mean, I'm letting you... Give the interpretation of the text. No, I no, I'm going to let you interpret it for me by reading it one more time. Verse 9. Okay. Read it again. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, hmm. but said, the Lord rebuke you. So you saying this language can be used of Jesus, that Jesus would dare not do something? So you're demoting Jesus, that Jesus dare not to come against Satan with a... Accusation? Well, the, you could say that Jesus dare not in the sense that he was afraid, but you could say that he uh, cared not or dare not. Uh, do the plain it reading is that he, he would he dare would do not something. Yeah. Reject. Uh, um, he yeah. would not. He he didn't need to um, speak evil. 
he's not the accuser of the brethren, just but he relied on his father's authority. No, friend, that's not what you find own. Jesus doing at all. You find Jesus telling Satan, get behind me. So one more time, let's break it down because you had a hard time with the very translation you cited. He wouldn't dare bring an accusation against Satan. Mm -hmm. And it's not how you interpret it. It means that he knew better than to come against Satan and rebuke and condemn him by his own authority. So invokes the authority of the Lord. So, but you wouldn't say that about Jesus, right? I wouldn't say that he doesn't have the authority. But this text says Michael didn't. That's why he dared not do it apart from invoking the Lord. See, this is why I have a problem with Seventh-day Adventists. They think they're reading the text. And so then to connect with Zechariah 3, it is offensive to me as a Trinitarian. And you're a Trinitarian mm -hmm. because they haven't understood Jude 1.9. They've just brushed over it. Jude 1.9 is saying that even Michael did not dare to go up against Satan because he knew he was a worthy foe. And he had to invoke the authority of the Lord against him. To say that this is Jesus is an insult unless you believe Jesus is a creature, which also would be an insult. It's right there. I mean, unless your tradition won't let you read the text. See, because you're a committed Seventh-day Adventist, you can't read it for what it is. You're going to have to explain it to agree with your position. But see, glory to God, I have the freedom to let the text say what it says. The text is obvious to anyone who hasn't been told it's got to be Jesus. Unless you're a Jehovah Witness. A Jehovah Witness would say, hey, you're right. Hey, amen. <laughs> Jesus is a creature, and he needs the Father's power to battle Satan. Well, you're not a Jehovah Witness, and you don't believe Jesus is a creature. So explain to me how Almighty Jesus dare not come up against Satan <clears throat> invoking his own authority. Give me one moment. Sure, go ahead. And then we can look at Zechariah 3 to show it doesn't. It's not at all analogous to Jude 1 9. Not at all. As you're looking, I'm going to just warm up my coffee. Guys, I'm just going to step away to warm up my coffee. We'll give this brother time because he's a Trinitarian, so we want to extend courtesy to him. So take your time, brother. I'll be right back. Coming, guys. I'm having gone anywhere. Uh, <laughs> it's what happens when you live stream. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right, I'm here, so don't think I lost you. All right. Okay, All right, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, brother. I'm back. If you need to say something, go ahead. If you need more time? That's fine. Let me go look at something. Yes. Well, I'll have to think more about that. Okay, that's uh, fine. How I, how I understand it is that Jesus would not stoop to the low level of, of creating an accusation um, as as these people would. And um, against dignitaries and against um, um, authority, rejecting authority and speaking evil yeah. of others. Mm -hmm. Uh, falsely, so how I have interpreted yeah. is that uh, Michael was showing a heavenly bearing in in not uh, having that that attitude and that character. Mm -hmm. And when it says that even Michael would not do that, yeah, it says dare not to do it. See, that's the problem. It's not simply if it said Michael wouldn't do that, he doesn't quote unquote slander because we know it's God, God's nature doesn't slander. Of? Say it again. I have not looked into other translations for the word dared. Have, yeah. have you? Or Well, I mean, if you want, we can explore it a little more now. I mean, <clears throat> it's it's unanimous. It's dare not. And because it's saying that Michael knew that Satan was a worthy adversary, 
not to be messed with. So don't slander him because if you slander him, you can then arouse his anger to come against you. And so Michael knew this is a worthy adversary and that he can only come against him by the authority of the Lord. So the point of the passage is if even Michael, this mighty being, knows enough not to simply slander and anger Satan to raise his ire, right, his anger, not you know, make him irate, but okay, comes see, against him by the, the authority difference. of the Lord. Say it again. No, I, I see the difference in our, in our interpretation of it. Yeah. Well, uh, the interpretation is quite plain. He would dare not do it. So the dare part is the difficulty, the dare part. Now, if you want to say that you can attribute it to Christ, more power to you. But let's go with, okay, Michael says the Lord rebuke you. And because the angel of the Lord in Zechariah 3 says the Lord rebuke you, that somehow shows that Michael and the Lord are one and the same. Let's go explore Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. Back to Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. Andrew Martin, Michael is only powerful against Satan because God gives him the power. That's the point, Andrew. So you gentlemen ask a good question. Spirit beings possess the authority and the power given them to them by God. And so Satan is no joke. He's a mighty spirit being. So is Michael. But Michael defeats Satan because God gives him power and authority to do so. And so Michael realizes that it is God who authorizes and empowers him to defeat Satan. That cannot be said of Christ if he is God, he's almighty, and he's the one who gives power and authority. You with me there, Andrew Michael? Are you with me? Because he asked a good question, Andrew. Did that make sense to you, Andrew Martin? Before we go to Zechariah 3, verse 1 and 2? Zechariah 3. Now, let's go to Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2, and let's see. Let's see if the context is similar or analogous to Jude. All right? To Jude. Because you're assuming the Lord, saying the Lord rebuke you, is analogous or proves that Michael is the Lord. But in Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2, what translation? Read it from your translation if you want. It's okay. fine by me. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Read it from your translation if you want. Um. Should I just read a little bit of context there? I Going mean, through. the context of Zechariah 3 starts at 1. Yeah, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hands to oppose him. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Mm -hmm. now, no, because that's the point you want to say. Verse 2, right? The Lord rebuke you? Sure. Okay, now, why, why do you assume just because the Lord here, who's the angel, is Michael, because he used the expression, the Lord rebuke you? Well, the connection is that it is a direct, the only other time in scripture where the Lord rebuke you is mentioned, okay. aside from Jude 1 9, is here. And sure. how I am taught to interpret the Bible, how I've learned to interpret the Bible is if you want to make an assumption, let the Bible interpret itself. So sure. you have to find where things could be mentioned elsewhere, especially even when we get to Revelation and other prophetic books. Mm -hmm. Um, let the Bible interpret itself. And uh, if if uh, in Jude 1, 9, it says that Michael said, the Lord rebuke you, mm -hmm. that it's a direct citation. I have my Bible. There's not an Adventist Bible, just a regular sure. and, um, yeah. and KJV. Yeah. And the reference that it has for the Lord rebuke you is to Zechariah 3, 2. Exactly. And they That's common. show a direct connection. And the argument wouldn't be that this says that this is Michael, but that it says that the Lord can say the Lord rebuke you. Mm -hmm. So that gives room for understanding that Michael could be the Lord because the Lord can say the Lord rebuke you. So why couldn't Michael be the Lord and say the Lord rebuke you? Because two things. Number one, we are explicitly told this angel is the Lord Jehovah. And number two, Jehovah often speaks of himself in the third person as Jesus did. For example, John 17, 3, Jesus says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Now, wasn't Jesus yes. speaking? Yes. So why is he speaking of Jesus Christ in the third person? Because he can. So just like here, we're told it's Jehovah. How do you know it's not Jehovah rebuking Satan in the third person? So he's not referring to the Father, but to himself in the third person. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say that question again? How do you know that in Zechariah 3, verse 2, because you're assuming there the Lord, because he's the angel, is rebuking Michael in the name of the Lord, meaning the Father, right? 
in 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 Zechariah three. Yeah, how do you know it's not the angel speaks out? I'm saying, please hear me clearly. Okay, oh, I was buffering. Okay. You're assuming that the angel who is called Lord in Zechariah 3 is rebuking Satan in the name of the Lord, meaning the Father, right? Or himself. I okay, so you do believe it's third person. So it can be third person, right? Yeah, it could be. Okay, but can you now prove that when Michael rebukes Satan in Jude 1 9, it's third person, meaning that Michael's actually talking about himself as a Lord when the context makes clear that he only went up against Satan by the authority of the Lord, which is not his own authority. How are they at all similar? But you're not on YouTube. Oh, I see. Sorry, guys. The buffering's bad. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Hopefully it gets better. Hold on. Okay. Let me repeat it. Again. All right, sorry. It's, I don't know why. Sorry, guys. I don't know if it's okay. Hopefully it won't. Yeah, I think you. All right. Now, let's do it again. Zechariah 3, verse 1 and 2. The angel there is clearly identified as the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know he's Jehovah. There's no body that because he's the angel. He's Jehovah. That's in Zechariah 3, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but then when he says the Lord rebuke you Satan You are can do we're gonna have to stop. All right. Sorry. I don't know what's going on. I want to break my modem yeah. <laughs> Okay, all right Zechariah 3 everyone there. Can we try this again? Yeah, this has the Lord Jesus too in Help Jesus name. Like please Lord for your glory. Okay. Amen. All right, now let's try this again. Zechariah 3, verse 1 and 2. I'm trying to walk our brother through it. Zechariah 3, verse 1 and 2. There we're told it's the angel, and he's called Jehovah. So the angel is Jehovah. Then the angel says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord who plucked this man as a firebrand plucked out of the fire. All right, paraphrasing there. Mm -hmm. You do accept the possibility that there the angel is not speaking of the Father, when he says the Lord rebuke you, he may be speaking of himself in the third person. That's a possibility, right? Well, I, I haven't. It's a possibility he's speaking of himself or in the authority of the Lord, okay. of his Father. But even if we, we say he's speaking in the authority of his Father, the fact that he's identified as Jehovah means that the Father's authority is his authority, and they're equal in that sense because he's called Jehovah. Okay. But if we go with the first point, because I'll grant the second one as well, but I'm trying to go step by step. If there the angel is calling himself Lord and speaking of himself in the third person, and for everyone to understand what third person is, buffering. guys, I don't know why it's buffering. Satan's upset. Lord Jesus, help us. Okay, for the for you guys again, let me share this. All right, here, let me share it. In the Bible, you'll find a common feature where God speaks of himself in the third person. Where Jesus speaks of himself in the third person. To so repeat the point for you guys to follow. Let me know if you guys are following. Let me know if you get, you're get you getting the point. Okay. John 17, verse 3. Jesus is praying. Jesus is praying. And he says, this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus is referring to himself in the third person. So just because you have someone speaking in the third person doesn't mean he's not speaking of himself. And that's in verses 1 to 2, John 17, verse 1 to 2, where Jesus says, Father, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Notice he's speaking of your son, third person, but he's the one who's the son. God does this often in the Old Testament. God will often speak of himself in the third person. God said to Moses, go up to the mountain where the Lord will appear to you. Okay? So you find third person use. So now the debate is Zechariah 3, verse 2. Is the angel who's called the Lord there? Is the angel who is the Lord saying, the Lord rebuke you, saying, the Lord who chose Joshua? Is he invoking the Lord of the Father, or is he speaking of himself in the third person? So just so I understand, if we go with the fact that he's speaking of himself in the third person, then there is no connection with Jude 1.9, mm -hmm. because in Jude 1.9, Michael is not speaking... Of himself in the third person when he rebukes Satan. He's not saying, the Lord rebuke you, meaning I rebuke you. The text mm -hmm. is clear. He's invoking the authority of another to come against Satan. But now, let's go with the view that the angel is invoking the authority of the Father. He's saying, the Lord, the Father, mm -hmm. rebuke you, Satan. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, is that context analogous to Jude one nine? When Jude 1, 9, we're told the reason why Michael is invoking the authority of the Lord is because he knows better than to come against Mike, uh, Satan 
apart from the authority of the Lord. Is that why the Lord, the angel who's the Lord doing that in Zechariah 3? Well, I think that's adding a lot of words to the word dared. Uh, because that, no, it's right there, Jude 1 9. He dared not come. See, that word dare is there. I mean, we can look at the Greek and see what it means. Okay, let's do that. Okay, let's do it. Okay, let's see what it means. There, hold on. All right, hold on. Let's look at it. What's the exact word? All righty. It's in all your translation, friends. So, but anyway, what are we going to do? All right. The devil is disputing he was reasoning. There's not. It did. Uk Elto Misen. Eto Misen. Okay, let me show you where this word is used in Matthew 22, 46. Can you read Matthew 22, 45, 46? And then we're going to look at the lexical usage. Can you go to Matthew 22, 40, 45, 46? The same use of the term. El, it's etul mason. Sorry for the Erasmian butchering of the Greek. Etul mason. Here, let me get you the link so you know I'm not lying. Let me get you guys the link too for those of you listening. Here you go. Etul Matthew. mason. Okay. One second, friend, and I got to send it to you, too. Sorry, I got to do several things at one time. It's Matthew 22, but read 45 and 46 so you can get a little context. Whereas if you want, you can go up to all the way 41 for the context. But it's Jesus quoting Psalm 110, and then he silenced them, right? Okay, let's see. Here's the link so you can see it. Eto Mason. Okay. Can you do yeah. Amen. Okay, yeah. Awesome. Sorry, guys. I don't know why it's buffering right now. It's maybe because there's too many people using the Internet. Okay, Matthew 22, 46 for the rest of you. That word dare used in Jude 1, 9 is the same word, exact word, is used in Matthew 22, 46. Are you guys following me in the tax? Because we, we, we're up to 180. We're losing people. I guess they're getting bored here. Are we boring you guys? Okay, now Matthew 22, 46. Read what it says for me if you can. Matthew 22, 46. It says, did anyone dare from that day? That's all I'm seeing. Did they what again? Did anyone dare from that day? They didn't dare do what? I don't see the context here. Well, 41 or 46, they no one dared to question him again and challenge his authority. That's the, that's the context. They didn't dare? Guys, we're just going to have to struggle with the buffering. You know Satan's upset when we plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Sorry, guys. Just so you know what we're talking about, even though the buffer, it's going to get better later. Matthew 22, 41, 46. For those of you listening, I gave you the link. The same word used in Jude 1, 9 is used in Matthew 22, 46, where it says those who oppose Jesus no longer dared to oppose him. Why did they not dare to oppose him? Because he stumped them and they were afraid. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the only use case for that word. The same word, but now I just gave you the lexicon. The lexicon uh -huh. doesn't help you. I just sent it to you in the text. Guys, here you go. What does this Greek word mean? Let me read it out. Here's the link. Guys, follow with me. To have courage to be bold. I dare endure and bold. Have courage. Make up the mind. So it's saying that Michael did not dare or have the courage to go against Satan to accuse him without invoking the Lord authority. Would you say that of Jesus? It says also can mean to put up with or to hold out in suffering. Yeah. And show and me in con context that's the meaning of that passage. See, this is again why when I said let's go into the Greek, mm -hmm. you're, you, I knew you're going to try to take the second or third possible meaning and ignore its contextual use in the context it's clearly he did not dare do this or wasn't bold to do this but you have to explain it away in order to make it agree with your assumption you see the problem with what i'm saying you're actually proving what i just said the plain contextual meaning is he didn't dare do this okay. but now you're looking for a second or third possible meaning that's not the contextual meaning see the well, problem we're having I I read the context differently. How? Uh, initially, that that Michael is setting an example of long suffering and and not uh, stooping down to violent accusations. Therefore, he. But it says he didn't dare do this. Why? Why use that word? And the same word, the same form of the word, is only used one other time. The same context that this group didn't dare do this. Why didn't he dare do that? 
and can it be used of Jesus if he's God Almighty? Okay, I mean, I can give it to you if that's if that's the well, all right. Okay, now, just again, we're, because again, I don't want to keep pressing the same point. We'll go into another one of your arguments to see what's on. Now, so far, you understand, your First Thessalonians 4, Jude 1, 9, to someone who doesn't already believe what you believe, they read it and they don't see what you see. And it's not because of indoctrination. It's just when I read First Thessalonians 4, and I read it even before I knew what the Trinity was and had a working knowledge of the biblical foundation Trinity, I never assume that the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the chump of God somehow connected Jesus to the archangel. I never made that connection. So it was a surprise to me when the Jehovah's Witnesses used that to prove he's Archangel Michael. Mm. And I never made the connection that in Jude 1, 8 to 9, somehow Michael rebuking Satan in the name of the Lord connects him with the angel of the Lord in Zechariah 3, who is clearly Jehovah God, because I saw the contexts are not the same. So you can continue to believe that, but that's because you already committed to seven-day Adventism. And if they said this is a doctrine, you can't question it. So I have to say in all honesty, your ultimate authority is not the Bible. It's your church and what your church tells you the Bible can and cannot mean. Well, I can I can correct you on that. I, okay. I am more, I am more uh, devout to the truth than I am to any okay. denomination. So you're willing to leave seven-day Adventism? No denomination. Are you willing to leave it if they're wrong, uh, Michael? I mean, I think that's a... A small issue, but... Um, no, because can you be a good Seventh-day Adventist and deny he's Michael? It's not. You can be a, you can be a Seventh-day Adventist and not believe that Michael is Jesus. Totally. Oh, really? Like, that okay. is not that's a salvational point. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, like, in, you know more uh, than me. Okay, that's fine. In in, uh, in the email, I, I started by saying that, uh, you know, this is not the most important issue that Adventists would want to talk about in the first place. It's not really that salvational Jesus is Lord, regardless whether he's Michael or not. No, I, um, not to what, cut you off. I just want to be clear. I know well, to them, they will not condemn people outside the church for denying Jesus is Michael as long as they're Trinitarian. That wasn't my point. Let me rephrase my point. Mm -hmm. Can you go to your elders and say, look, I don't believe Jesus is Michael. Michael is a creation of Jesus when the official theology of Seventh-day Adventism is Michael is Jesus. He's not a creation of Jesus. And you can say that, and they will, won't will tell you to stop representing them. They will not. Okay. All right. I, um, I got to take your word for it. It's not, um, again, it's not, it's not something we consider salvation. We have 28 fundamental beliefs that if we stand, like that we should stand by those in order to, you know, be able to teach in church mm. and, um, and uh, represent the church, but aside from those twenty-eight fundamental beliefs, yeah, um, Michael is not one of those. So, okay, you know, there's there's room for interpretation. Okay, I, I mean, I take your word for it. I just want to let Wayne Whitaker understand he doesn't believe Jesus is a created angel because he doesn't believe Michael is a creature. Wayne, mm -hmm. Seventh Day Adventists think because Jesus is Michael, Michael is the name of Almighty God the Son, who's not a creature. So they're Trinitarian, and they think that one of the names of the second person of the Godhead is Jesus, uh, Michael. So Michael is not a creature. Michael is the eternal, uncreated Son of God who's God Almighty, one with the Father and the Spirit. So they're Trinitarian in that sense. Lord willing, maybe after this we'll have a future discussion on, on salvation. But now give me your second line of evidence that you think is very strong. Let's deal with that, and then we'll call it a day because i got to talk about Abraham and Isaac. So give me your yeah. second most powerful argument. One is just as powerful, if not more so, than the one you just gave me. Okay. Um, do I have? Can I? Can I say something before? Sure. Say what you that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the email I sent you was um, asking you for burden of proof on your statements on the last uh, live stream that you did with uh, David Wood and and. Um, mm -hmm. um, and as you can I, tell, I don't I, read lengthy emails, right? <laughs> I learned that. <laughs> yeah. I don't read you know, because I don't have time to do that. Quarantined and it was Sabbath, and you know I had a lot of time to write. And yeah. <laughs> I don't so read. I and I, no, let's just let me repeat it to people, guys. If you want me to respond to an argument, you can't write me linked emails. I don't read them anymore. I used to do that in 1990. I went into full time ministry, and I did it so much I got tired of it. Why? Because, because in the early days we didn't have. YouTube or Facebook live stream, everything was written. So I had no choice but to write. And I would have people bombarding me with 20, 30 emails 
and I get tired of it. So I don't read. Once I see a LinkedIn email, it's deleted. That's why I said, let's have a talk about it. But go ahead. What do you want me to explain? Um, well, uh, there were a few claims mm -hmm. that, uh, for example, that Michael could not be Jesus, mm -hmm. the, the pre-incarnate form of, of um, mm -hmm. Christ, uh, because in, in Revelation chapter 12, mm -hmm. in um, verse... Yeah, if you start at verses and 1 and read all the way down, yes, it's about the woman giving birth to the Messiah and the Messiah taking the After the fact that... that that, that the child is born and, and is ascended yes. to caught up with God on his throne. Yes. <clears throat> Why would I assume that then Michael is Christ when Christ is taken to the throne, which coincides with the victory of Michael over Satan? So my statement in the email was that um, that is, you, you were asking David, isn't that logical? Isn't that logical? You're sure. a philosopher. Wouldn't that be a logical thing? Sure, it so is. So I would like to go there to Revelation. Yeah, guys, we're going to Revelation 12 next. So guys, are you paying attention? Because you got to learn from this too. We're going to go to Revelation 12, the other passage that I brought up in response because people say that Michael has angels and he overthrows Satan. Clearly, that has to be Jesus. That's one of the arguments that Joe's witnesses. And I said, no, it's not clearly the case that it's Jesus because the child born taken up to the throne, that's Jesus. And his enthronement is what enables Michael to defeat Satan. But we'll get into that. We'll unpack the meat of it. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, that, that chronological order, I don't think it's biblically sound because in Revelation chapter 12, mm -hmm. so you see verses 1 through 6, it talks about the dragon. Mm -hmm. And she persecutes the woman that's clothed with the sun, being with child. And uh, the great fiery dragon had seven diadems on his head. His mm -hmm. tail drew a third of the stars of the heaven. And this is uh, chapter 12, verse 4. Mm -hmm. And he was ready to devour her child as soon as he was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. So here the child is Jesus incarnate yep. and then persecuted by the dragon and mm -hmm. then is caught up to God. Then it says that the woman fled into the wilderness mm -hmm. where she has a place prepared mm -hmm. by God that they should feed her for 1,260 days. Yep. Okay. Now, then the verse 7, you say this is following that mm -hmm. uh, event in, in, yes. in the timeline. Mm -hmm. And it says, and a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that this is conclusive evidence that Michael is Jesus, mm -hmm. but... What I'm saying is that it is not conclusive that it is not Jesus. Why not? Because the story begins again. The same story about the dragon persecuting the woman and the child begins once again. And it says Where? that the it's like repeating the same story and then adding more details. And you see this. No, it's not a repeat of the time. same story. No, because huh? no, no. If you read it, the okay. woman is in heaven. She's now on earth and he pursues her while she's on earth. It's not the same story. It's him still trying to devour the woman who was in heaven, who's now on earth in the wilderness. Read it. What? So you're saying in verse 1 she was yeah. in heaven? Can you read? I didn't say it. The text said it. Read it. 12-1. Yeah. That's what you're referring to. Yeah, read it. Read it. A woman clothed with a sun with a moon under her feet yeah. and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Go ahead. So you think that's talking about little location? or No, or it's a, symbolic it's a sim is symbolism. It's all symbolic language, just like Satan, unless you believe he's a little dragon. This is this is representing Israel, the woman who gives birth to Christ, and it's using uh, – what's the term I'm looking for? Here you have – because, again, if you keep reading, Revelation 12, 1 and 2, keep reading, and then he sees another sign. And what does he see? And another sign appear in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven head and ten horns okay. and seven diadems. So this is a cosmic battle, right? Yeah. Okay, and this cosmic battle takes place between two cosmic entities. The woman who's clothed States, with the constellations, uh, the, the woman who's clothed with the constellations, stars, mm -hmm. sun and moon, and the dragon. And when she gives birth to the sun, and then what you did not read for me, and this is why I kind of was shocked. Read Revelation 12, 1 again, because you didn't read it for me. Clearly, now you skipped the word. Great, now a great sign appeared in heaven. A did you know you skipped the word the heaven? Sun? When you read it to me, that's where you threw oh, me off. Sorry, I wasn't trying to. Now, okay, so where's this heaven. woman? A sign appeared in heaven. Okay, okay. where's this woman? In heaven. But then, where does the dragon pursue her later on? While well, she's in the wilderness, right? Yes. Okay, so what do you mean 
it's not chronological. He goes from battling her in heaven to now battling her on earth. So you're saying the woman is the people of God, Israel, and they were in heaven before? No, they this were is on symbolic earth? language. That's what I'm trying to say. But follow the symbolism. The symbolism is God's people are pursued and persecuted by the dragon. They fail, he fails in devouring Israel. And it talks about Israel giving birth to the Messiah, who now is enthroned. And because of his enthronement, that then gives Michael the authority to then cast Satan out of heaven to the earth. This is all symbolism. So in other words, it's symbolic language to denote that Christ's enthronement is what results in the victory of Michael over Satan and the victory of the woman and her children. Because if you keep reading from Revelation 12, 13 to 17, her children who hold to the testimony of Christ, that's the church. Christ's enthronement guarantees their victory and their protection against the dragon who seeks to destroy them. Okay, can I summarize that and just see if I got it? Yes. So you're saying that the woman was in heaven. Yes. Symbolically, right? A, a, symbolically, mm -hmm. a cosmic battle. She was then on the earth during the battle with no you with you read it read it for me what does it say he did he flung a third of the stars to the earth where did he flung them from from, from heaven okay so you're you're answering your own question the battle's in heaven it's not a little battle it's symbolic you're answering it okay right you just answered it right i see that okay so this is my understanding, um, if I may summarize it. Sure. This is talking about the same event. Let me let me just explain that. Sure. Um, the, Satan is uh, brings a third of the stars with him, which in Revelation. And I what are the third of the stars? It says that the stars are the angels. No, it doesn't. Uh, You're misreading it. No, it doesn't. Okay, in Revelation 1, 9, it says the seven stars and the seven angels of the seven churches. Okay, but so, all, you're going too fast. I will correct you step by step if you don't rush. What okay. makes you assume those angels of the seven churches are angels as opposed to messengers, meaning the bishops of the churches? Because well, you're aware the word angel is used of human beings, right? Yeah, I, I understand that. So now let me ask you a question because you went to Revelation 1.9. I know where you're going with this. I uh, Believe me, I, I wasn't born yesterday. I was born the day before. I, I, okay. You're when, older than me. When, when, John, when Jesus tells John, write on a scroll, on a Bible, and send yeah. it to the seven churches, and then it's read to the angel of the church. Why does the spirit being need a physical book to be read to him? Well, I know this This is talking about physical messengers in that. Okay, say sense, it again. But it's I want everyone here. Hold on. Say it again. So the angels of the churches are what again? The angels of the seven churches could be physical messengers. Because, so now, yeah, they don't need to read a book if they're okay, but spiritual now, messengers. Okay, but now notice what you did, my friend. I was, I mean, I've been, you went to Revelation 1-9 to show it has to be angels. But now you backtrack saying, well, maybe not angels. It may be physical messengers, meaning the leaders of the churches that the book is sent to. So we're back to square one. How do you know that the third of the stars are angels? So you can't use the actual Greek words to say stars are messengers and then no, say stars, stars are messengers in Revelation. Stars 4. have nothing to do whether they're spirit beings or human beings because even the word angel can refer to a human being. So the third of the stars, you said they're angels. You mm -hmm. went to Revelation 1-9. Well, right? it says they're angels. It doesn't say they're people. It says okay, they're but am I, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking Assyrian, you're not understanding. You know the Greek right. word angel can mean a human messenger, right? Yes, so I don't I care what that. an English translation says, because even the word angel can mean a human angel, not a spirit one. Prove it's a spirit angel. Well, I think the Holy Spirit left that for us to interpret it after it was written. Okay, but the Holy Spirit inspired that in Greek. The Greek is angelos. And the word yeah. angelos in the Greek New Testament is used of human figures. Do you want me to show you that? Well, I, I, I agree with you that okay. in Revelation 1-9, the, the application of it is that it is human, human agencies. Okay. <clears throat> so then let's forget the, your appeal to Revelation 1-9 okay. again. Let's go back okay. to Revelation 12. How do you know that the third of the stars are spirit beings when it says they're not joining Satan? Satan is hurling them. He's actually destroying them. He's attacking them. He's there. He's not gathering them because it says a tail hurled them, right? No, mine says drew, drew a third of the stars of heaven. But finish it. Drew them to the earth. Okay, drew them to the earth. Oh, yeah, and threw them to the earth. Okay, but 
Are so are these stars on Earth now? They apparently. Okay, but then Revelation twelve seven it says the war between Satan and his angels took place in heaven, not on Earth. Yes. So, so then, why is he sending? See... Why is he taking a third of the stars on Earth if those are part of his angelic host to do battle with him? Okay. Um, see, there's I... two. You understand where I'm going? Now, I'm not going to cut you off. Yeah. Too many assumptions on a text that's highly symbolic to make your case. Whereas the plain symbolism, this is what I'm trying to get at. The plain symbolism of Revelation 12 is this, mm -hmm. that the birth of the Messiah and his enthronement is what results in Michael overthrowing Satan and the protection of Israel and the church. That's all the symbolism is saying. But there it's clear that the child who's enthroned is not Michael, but it's his enthronement that results in Michael defeating Israel. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because this goes back to the book of Daniel. Who is the angel assigned to the protection of Israel? Michael, right? Michael. Yes. And so who gives birth to the Messiah? Israel. Mm -hmm. So when the Messiah sits enthroned as Israel's representative, his enthronement then empowers Israel's angelic guardian to defeat their enemy. Mm -hmm. That's the symbolism. So how do you explain then verse 13 and 14? and what, What's there to explain? 15. So now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, which is after the war in heaven. And after the woman is taken into the wilderness. Michael, right. Okay. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Talk yes. About the same but finish woman. it. Finish it. So she's already given birth to the child, right? Who gave birth to the male child? It's, it's so it's already, the, the child has already been born, right? Well, he's alluding to the fact, to the story he already mentioned. You know what you just did again? You again had to deny the fact that this is referring to an event that already took place. She already gave birth to the child, and that's why he's pursuing her. Because she's he's angry now because it's the child's enthronement that result in him being thrown to the earth. And now he wants to take out his anger on the woman who gave birth to the child, whose enthronement resulted in his expulsion. And so where is he now pursuing the woman? It's no longer in heaven. It's on the earth. But the woman was given. Uh -huh, Go ahead. Read it. Cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Mm -hmm. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. What happened? The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now keep reading, all the way 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so now you see a battle takes place in heaven. Mm -hmm. He's trying to destroy the child. Before it's born, he fails. The child is enthroned. His enthronement results in Michael now being authorized to hurl Satan to the earth. Now mm -hmm. Satan is vicious and angry, more so with the woman, because it's her child that she gave birth to that results in his expulsion. She pursues her. She's now on earth in the wilderness. He fails to devour her because she's protected, like I said. So now he goes and makes war against the church because the children mm -hmm. who keep the commandments and believe in Jesus Christ would be the church. So mm -hmm. still I'm not seeing how Michael is Messiah. Well, Okay, so I see two different applications for this is that they're the same story with more details or that they're chronological and the war in heaven is right in between the dragon fighting Israel and then okay, the dragon even, fighting God's people. Right? Uh, brother, even if we take it, it's not chronological. Let's just say it's repeating the same point twice. You okay. still don't get Michael being Jesus because nothing shows Michael is Jesus. In fact, the clear meaning is Jesus is someone else and Michael is someone else. So even if we don't read it chronologically. Well, that's... Show me how that the Messiah, the, the Jesus, the Messiah who's enthroned is Michael. My argument is that it doesn't say it cannot be Michael. It, uh, like, well, the plain reading to me is, but okay, okay, but now, so what? What proof do you have now that he's Michael then? So this proof that I see is clearly against Jesus being Michael. Okay, put that aside. I, and I'm not shocked you don't see it, and I'm not trying to put you down. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't see that Jesus is called Jehovah. Okay. I'm not shocked that the Joe witness doesn't see that Jesus is called Jehovah. Does that shock you? I'm not shocked. Okay, so why do you think I'm not shocked that you don't see that this text shows that Jesus can't be Michael? Because you already believe he's Michael. So I'm not shocked. When you tell well, me I don't see it, I expect you not to see it. Well, when I, how, when I try to put myself 
in the shoes of someone else, then because because it depends on your premise, it depends on your paradigm. So if what I did when I was repeating repeating the two ways you could interpret it, I was trying to put myself into two different paradigms mm-hmm. and seeing which one would exclude Michael and his angels from being the Christ. So if Michael and his angels fighting is right in the middle of Christ ascending to heaven and then the dragon persecuting the church after um, the war in heaven, it still doesn't mean that it can't be Christ because if Christ ascends to heaven, he could be Michael. But I see that Michael would be the name pre-incarnation. So it couldn't be in that situation if that's, if that's impossible for him to retake the name of Michael. But if my paradigm is that this is the same, I'm retelling of the same story, I'll, I'll definitely be studying okay, this. Now, let's go with that. Let's go. Mm-hmm. You're missing the basic fact that the child is not making war. He's enthroned. Mm-hmm. So this is, I, I think, because you're, you don't, and, I'm not, and I say this because I see you're a Trinitarian. So I'm not saying you're an Arian, and I'm not treating you as if you're a heretic who denies the Trinity because you believe in the Trinity. But, yeah, friend, sure. I want you to understand the child is enthroned. He's not battling. He's mm-hmm. enthroned while Michael battles. So if you want to take it chronologically or not, that's irrelevant. The one who's battling is Michael, but the child is enthroned. He's not battling. He's on the throne as Michael battles. So unless you want to say that the child then manifests as Michael, so that there's a sense he's on the throne, but then he manifests as a warring angel, it is clear to anyone who doesn't believe that Jesus is Michael, the child is not Michael, he's different from Michael. Mm-hmm. Because the child doesn't say the child was taken to God's throne. And then he, because John could have simply said, and then the child and his angels declared war. Why can he just come out and say it that plainly? Because it's obvious for John that the child's enthronement is what results in Michael being authorized to expel Satan. So Michael declares war against Satan by the power of, of the child who's enthroned as Israel's representative, giving him the authority to then defeat Israel's foe because he's the guardian angel of Israel, Daniel 12, verse 1. But if you believe that Jesus is Michael, then this passage cannot mean or cannot appear to be saying what it says. It's got to mean something else. See, that's my point. Once you're committed to something, no amount of evidence will suffice. And that's why I said, instead of asking me to show why it can't be Michael, I'm still waiting for the proof that Michael is Jesus. What proof do you have? Just, can you give me just one? Because we've already been here for a while, and yeah. I want to go into my – and it's not because – and I want to invite you again to talk about salvation as understood by the seven-day Adventists. But what I need now is yeah. the strongest verse or verses that clearly show Jesus is Michael. Okay, well, I um... – From the context of several pa- passages, for example, in Daniel chapter 10, 25, Messiah is called... Daniel what again? 10, 25. Miss- you mean J- Daniel 9, 25? Prince. Daniel chapter 10, verse 25. I'm going to try to summarize everything. Yeah, but Daniel 9, know. not 10, right? Because it's Daniel 9 where he's called Mashiach Nagid, right? Mm-hmm. The Messiah, the Daniel Prince? Daniel chapter 9, 10, 25. Say it again. Daniel See, 9, 25. The Prince in Matthew, uh, chapter, Mark, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Because yes. you said 10, 25. That's where you confused me. Sorry. Okay, now, but you understand that's not the word prince as they used in Daniel 8, right? Or Daniel 10, right? Different word. Yes. You know that, right? There in Daniel 9, 25, it says Mashiach Nagid, Nagid, mm-hmm. ruler. Nagid. Whereas in Daniel 10, it's Sar. Mm-hmm. So why are they, uh, why do you assume because Messiah is a ruler Nagid, and then Michael is a ruler or prince, Sar, they're one and the same. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was studying that last night, and um, Jesus is called Messiah the Prince. Um, and it's not the same word, right? Now, they can be synonymous, but still no, it's not they the same. can be synonymous, yeah. I don't, I don't see that. But you don't believe Messiah is one of many princes. You believe he's the king of kings and lord of lords, right? He's the first of princes. This would be the second translation. If Say it again. The first of princes would be the second most common or third okay, most now, common. Now, brother, translation. brother, can, can you understand what you just did? So you're not seeing it. Let's go with your translation, the first of princes. But you just argued that Michael is the only archangel. But if you say he's the first of princes, that means there are other ruling angels. You know that, right? Well, first could be 
the first of the leaders of the angelic host. Okay, but the, leaders the, means the archangel. Host. You're still not getting it. See this? I'm not. I'm not trying to cut you off, honestly, but you're not getting it, my younger brother. And out of love for you, I want you to understand. Let's go with what you just said. Uh, it can mean the the what the first of. How did you define it? Leading angels. You said leading angel, right? The first of the archangels, of the chief angels. Of the okay, but wait. Princes. You just got done about 40 minutes ago saying he's the only archangel because no other archangel is mentioned. But you just admit he's the first of archangels, so he's not the only one. Well, we know that. Do you understand what you said to me? 40, you don't remember your point 40 minutes ago when you told me. First Thessalonians 4.16, the voice of an archangel. And then Michael and Jude is the only archangel mentioned. And therefore, the burn is on me, Sam Shimon, to show there are other archangels. But you just now conceded there are other archangels. So that means the main argument you started with, you just refuted. I didn't mean to say that. I don't know. Um, I don't think. So how should we translate either. Daniel ten thirteen? Okay, so let's say it says Michael, one of the chief princes. In this in this chapter, is talking about at least two princes, right? The prince of Persia, and you could. Um, Jesus himself called Satan the prince of this world. And there's a battle, a cosmic battle between two leaders here. Yeah. That you would agree. Michael. Yeah, but the, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't agree that the prince of Persia is necessarily Satan because Satan has a network of evil spirits. Because in that same Daniel 10, it says the prince of Greece will help the prince of Persia mm -hmm. to battle against Michael. But my point was this. Here's my point. I want to make it clear. Mm -hmm. Michael, if he's one of, then we go back to my point. Jesus is not one of anything. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, the prince of all princes. Mm -hmm. So then if Michael is one of, then he's not the ruling ruler of all rulers, the king of all kings, the God of all gods. So I'm back to how does this show it's Jesus when Jesus is the king of all ki kings, the Lord of all lords, the God of all gods. But Michael is just one of those kings, one of those rulers. Okay. I know also that the word of the is added for the English translation, wouldn't it? Okay, well, because words are supplied in a translation to make more clear what is obvious in another language. Because there's language, things yeah. you say in one language that you need to supply additional words in a target language to make it sensible mm -hmm. to a target uh, language for an audience, whereas the original recipients understand what the text is saying. Yeah, he's one of the chiefs. But even if we go with first chief of rulers it's still plural he's not the only one but anyway i don't want to keep hammering this if you want think about it we'll set up something in the future lord willing maybe next time we talk about how do seven day adventists understand salvation i'd like to talk to you so email me when you have time maybe sometime yeah. in the upcoming weeks next week or so but let me know and it's not yeah. i want to cut you short because i gotta teach i have to preach on I appreciate Abraham. it. Appreciate thank you time. and i just want you to know i treat you as a brother because you're trinitarian we love you for the sake of the Lord, and thank you for this conversation. Email me when you have time to talk about salvation as understood by the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. Okay, brother? That will be a, a good uh, – um, help me learn. Good. And guys, pray for him. He's a Trinitarian who loves the Trinity, so pray for him. I don't want to give away too many details. He's being used mightily by God. Let's pray for him. He's a soldier for the triumph God. God bless you and your family. And keep Amen. You. Thank you, Sam. Take care, buddy. Bye. Okay, folks, uh, I'm going to shut down this stream and start another one. Are you ready for Are you ready for me to show Abraham and Isaac as a picture of Jesus for Resurrection Sunday? Right, are you guys ready or are you guys tired? It's now 2 p.m. my time, which means it's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Crack, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't go that far. But anyway, you're entitled. If you want to go that far, that's fine. Amen, Lois. Guys, I'm going to share something with you. Do you know what Satan tried to do to me yesterday? Can I share this with you guys? And I'll share it now because I need your prayers. Do you know what Satan did to me to discourage me? We had about 180. We went down 132. What, people got bored? Okay. Last night in the live stream, God blessed us last night after the debate. We're up to 250 people. Praise the Lord Jesus. Please, Lord, bring more. We go to 300, 400. Right? In the middle of my conversation, some guy that I don't talk to, he's an Assyrian guy, out of nowhere, like a tool of the devil, sent me a picture from my ex-wife's, I think, Instagram, where she's there with her boyfriend and my two daughters, 
and he's holding my daughter for a family picture, and he sent it to me last night. Can you believe that? A man with a tattoo holding my oldest daughter, and they're smiling in the camera because that was Satan's way of trying to dig the knife and destroy my joy. Folks, you need to believe the spirit realm is real, Satan is real, because God is real. And you know why that happened? Satan wanted to destroy my peace and joy because it's the resurrection weekend, and he wanted to discourage me, get me depressed so I don't glorify Jesus. But you see what? He that is in us is greater than he who is in the world. The blood of Jesus is almighty to shield us and cleanse us. He failed because I'm still here. He failed because we glorified Jesus. He failed because I'm going to do another live stream. And as long as Jesus is in us, in me, as long as I'm covered by the blood of Jesus, as long as the Holy Spirit seals us, he will always fail because my daughters are not my life. Jesus is my life. As much as I love them, I pray I love him more, and I entrust them to you, Lord Jesus. That man is not their father. You chasten him and their mother, and you deal with it. I have to focus on you. Focus on you. Amen? Amen. So, guys, it's 2, 2 p.m. Let's start in, in half an hour, right? Half an hour? Half an hour. Can we do that? Or should we do it in an hour, give people more time? But do you promise come back because we're up to 180. Last night was 250. Come on now. Make me happy. We want more. I want to beat David Wood, Hater Wood. Okay, let's start. Let me announce it now. 30 minutes. Come back now. Don't lie to me and invite people. Christ is risen, risen indeed. I'll be back.